Hello, and welcome to the latest expert series webinar. Today's webinar is Index Methodology, What You Don't Know But Should. This is a complimentary Index Universe webinar, courtesy of Russell Indexes. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the managing editor of Index Universe, the public face of Index Universe LLC, and the leading authority on news and data about ETFs and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today is David Koenig. He is an investment strategist with the index team at Russell Indexes. Dave does research for advisors and does various types of client outreach on behalf of Russell Indexes. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to know that I'll be asking Dave questions throughout his presentation, but there will definitely be a Q&A at the end. So audience members, please remember that you can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. Russell's indexing business is now almost 30 years old. And in the equities realm, the company calculates more than 700,000 indexes, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including 83 countries and 10,000 securities. In all, more than $4.1 trillion in assets were benchmarked to Russell indexes at the end of last year. And that's a lot of money. So let's take a step back and consider what these numbers mean. We're now living in a world where broad market benchmarks, like the Russell 3000, which encapsulates the entirety of the U.S. equities universe, have been sliced and diced into many variations. After all, as I said a moment ago, Russell calculates 700,000 indexes. This breaking down of benchmarks into smaller pieces leads us to use words like index. Now, on the one hand, it's totally accurate to say that all benchmarks are also indexes. But the reverse isn't true, which is to say that all indexes are not benchmarks. As confusing as that sounds, these semantics do matter because of exchange-traded funds. In 20 years, ETF assets under management have grown from nothing to more than $1.5 trillion, and more than 99% of all those ETF assets are linked to some index, whether that's the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, or some far more exquisitely calibrated index, such as the Russell Low Volatility Index. In fact, we now inhabit an investment universe where new indexes are literally being created with the creation of future ETFs in mind. And by the way, one of the world's biggest exchange-traded funds, the iShares Russell 2000 ETF, has almost $28 billion in assets. It's easy to forget that that entire massive fund is organized around a small-cap index, the Russell 2000, that was created and is managed on an ongoing basis by Russell Investments. Now, to be clear, during this hour, we are not going to talk about ETFs per se, and Dave will likely decline to talk about specific ETFs, but what he will do and what we are exploring is to explain what goes into indexes and how investors should think about index construction and index selection. After all, not all indexes are created equal, as the differing returns of two funds with similar aims makes totally clear. It's been about 40 years since John Bogle began marketing the world's first retail index mutual fund, and by now indexing is an established and rapidly growing and evolving piece of the investment universe. This webinar will help investors think about the basics of indexing in a clear and purposeful way. So let's get into it with Dave Koenig of Russell Investments. Dave? Well, thanks, Ollie, for that introduction. And I'd like to very much thank everybody who's taken the time out of your busy schedule to join us on today's call. We greatly appreciate your time and, and your interest. Um, so I, I would just add to your, your, uh, your introduction that um, we are very excited, as, as you mentioned, um, we'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary in 2014, having introduced our U.S. index series in 1984. Uh, the Russell 3000 index, uh, the broad uh, U.S. equity benchmark, and then its size components, the Russell 1000 index of large cap stocks, and the Russell 2000 index, uh, which was, of course, the first small cap benchmark. And uh, many of our innovations have been widely adopted uh, across the marketplace over the years. Uh, you mentioned we do indeed uh, calculate 700,000 benchmarks on a daily basis. And in addition to the $4.1 trillion in assets benchmarked to Russell indexes, I would point out that more than uh, $600 billion in assets 
are invested directly in products based on Russell indexes. So the, the goal of my presentation today is, is really to provide a, a broad overview of some of the key characteristics of uh, index construction that are important for investors to understand when selecting an index for either a uh, benchmark or as the basis for an exchange-traded fund or other uh, index-based investment product. At Russell, we understand very clearly based on our, our 30 years of experience that uh, index methodology is very important for investors to understand because, as Ollie mentioned, uh, indexes that follow the same basic uh, strategy or objective can be constructed in very different ways. And that, of course, leads to significantly different exposures and meaningful potential differences in performance. Uh, so by understanding index methodology, investors have an opportunity to uh, clearly uh, understand how, uh, how their index is, is uh, delivering exposures, how consistent those exposures uh, should be over time, and potentially avoid uh, inadvertent exposures and potentially unintended outcomes. So before we dive in here, just for a moment to step, to step back for a little bit of context, um, if we think about how professional in investment uh, uh, managers typically evaluate and select uh, actively managed strategies, for example, they, they generally spend significant time and devote significant due diligence to understanding a, a, a manager's philosophy, process, the people, and ultimately the performance. Uh, this is often referred to as the four P's. But what we see sometimes when we look at index-based strategies is that investors may spend uh, a, a good amount of time looking into the characteristics of the investment product, which of course is critically important as well, but they sometimes might spend less time truly understanding the underlying index methodology. And again, at, at Russell, we clearly understand that it's very important that investors understand those characteristics of the investment product, but also very clearly how the underlying index uh, is constructed. So to that end, here on the first slide, um, there are many pieces of uh, index criteria that are important for investors to understand. Uh, but we put together this simple framework as a way to illustrate some of the key criteria that can help investors begin to better understand their indexes. So we start with these three uh, broad categories, um, and then we'll take a look at a few individual pieces of criteria within each of these categories uh, as we go through the presentation. So the first broad category is the, the seemingly simple consideration of market coverage. So of course all investors need to understand what market exposure they're seeking when selecting an index. But less obvious are some of the design choices that can go into uh, determining how the index is constructed that can lead to uh, differences in, for instance, how representative of a coverage the index provides. Now, the second category of construction approach is all of the details for how the index is uh, constructed. And there are many, many pieces of criteria in this category that we, talk, that we could talk through and spend a great deal of time on, and we'll take a look at a few of those as we go through the presentation. And then the third broad category that we consider is ongoing maintenance. And this is also a very important uh, category of criteria, but one that sometimes gets less attention uh, from investors that, than is warranted. Um, because once an index is constructed, it needs to be maintained. And the, the design choices that go into determining how the index is maintained will have significant uh, influence on, for instance, how consistent an index delivers its targeted exposures over time. So moving to the next slide and just dig, digging down uh, a little bit further into a few of the pieces of criteria within each category, uh, within market coverage, an important consideration for investors is representativeness. So how well, how accurately does an index provide exposure to its targeted uh, market segment? Is that exposure fully representative or comprehensive, or is there, are there potential gaps in the exposure that um, an investor might not be aware of without looking further into the index methodology? Now, portfolio fit is another uh, very important consideration, and of course, it's important to understand how incorporating an index into a portfolio based on how representative its coverage is, 
how incorporating that portfolio, that index into the portfolio will affect the overall uh, risk return profile of the portfolio and how does that fit with the investor's objectives. In terms of construction, construction approach, a key consideration is objectivity and transparency. So it's important to understand uh, how, uh, whether the index is constructed using a very objective and transparent approach in which the, the rules are well understood and clear, or is the process more subjective and less transparent in nature. And then weighting methodology, another key consideration. Are the constituents of the index weighted by market capitalization, or are they potentially weighted by some other characteristics um, that we'll take a look at as we go through the presentation as well? Um, ongoing maintenance, uh, corporate actions, another key consideration. How are corporate actions such as IPOs, mergers and acquisitions, and other actions incorporated into the index? Again, is the, the process for incorporating these various actions into the index objective and transparent? Is there a, a set uh, maintenance schedule that is clear and understood? Or again, are these actions incorporated on a more of a subjective basis? And then finally, rebalancing. Uh, clearly a, a, a key consideration. How frequently is the index rebalanced? Does it use an annual reconstitution process, for example? So if we turn to the... Dave, can I just chime in really quickly? I just Absolutely. wanted to, to, to do a pullback. Uh, this is going to be out, a little bit away from this uh, very detailed kind of uh, uh, comments you're making, but just the, the concept of indexing. I mean, it's so easy to convey to someone, you know, at, the, at, at a ball game, on the street, what, what an active manager does. But it's, it's difficult to convey... Uh, what indexing is, and I'm wondering, how did this all start? You know, I know, I know Bogle started the first index mutual fund, but can you just shed a little bit of light on this transition? Where how did that little door get open, and let alone how how it's gotten more wide open over over these four decades since Bogle did launch that fund, as I said earlier? Sure, absolutely, and and maybe we we can step back even even further than that and um, uh, go back uh, to to uh, more than 100 years ago, really, the first uh, equity market indexes as we think of them today were created, of course, with the introduction of the uh, the Dow Jones Transportation Average, or what became the Dow Jones Transportation Average. It started as a collection of mostly railroad railroad stocks um, in 1884, and then the Dow Jones Industrial Average in uh, 1896. Um, these indexes were introduced as uh, basically simple uh, market barometers or ways to measure the, the movement of the market. That's how Charles Dow described them. And uh, they were price weighted, which is very important as well. Um, we've heard quite a bit about price weighting in recent weeks, in fact, with some of the changes in the constituents of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, and and uh, the questions around that and how companies with higher prices uh, have uh, greater influence on, on indexes constructed in that manner. So we've seen indexes themselves uh, evolve over uh, many years since that time in how they're constructed and also how they're used. Um, so indexes moved really from price weighting to market cap weighting over time. Uh, where the, the weighting methodology is one around uh, market cap being price times number of shares available in the marketplace, of course, um, as a more representative way of the actual uh, opportunity set in the marketplace. And then, of course, the way indexes uh, were used also evolved. Um, they continued to be market measures, of course, but they also became benchmarks, uh, as you mentioned at the outset, uh, Ollie. Uh, thinking about indexes versus benchmarks, there is a, a, an interesting distinction there um, that we can look at. Um, so they became benchmarks or, or a way to measure the performance of professional investment managers. Um, but they continued to evolve, of course, and um, we really we, we saw uh, indexes being used as the direct basis for investment strategies uh, beginning in the early 1970s. So the first institutional index funds were uh, developed in 1971. A gentleman uh, by the name of uh, John McQuan, uh, along with David Booth, uh, working at, uh, with Wells Fargo at that time, created the first institutional index fund for uh, Samsonite's corporate pension plan. And then a couple of uh, uh, additional institutional funds were created shortly thereafter. 
And then, as you mentioned, uh, Jack Bogle at Vanguard introduced the first index mutual fund a few years after that. Um, it's important to point out, however, that those uh, developments uh, of using indexes as the direct basis for investment products uh, was not without some controversy. Uh, we we uh, hear about Bogle's folly uh, at the time it was called, and there was a great deal of, of criticism and skepticism around index-based investments from a number of perspectives, from a, uh, a moral perspective, if you will, as to um, accepting simply average market returns. Uh, as well as questions around uh, the prudence of these portfolios uh, for, for uh, of these index-based strategies for uh, investors' portfolios. But indexing um, did catch on. It, it, it uh, continued to grow and gather assets, moving from about $6 million in uh, early 1971 to uh, about $10 billion by, by 1980. And most recent estimates, uh, I believe P&I published, uh, Index-based assets are uh, about $7.3 trillion currently. So indexing has grown considerably. We, we, con we continue to hear some of this debate that you referred to in terms of active versus passive, although I think uh, it, it's really evolved to one of active and passive now. Um, at Russell, we believe that both actively managed strategies and index-based strategies have an appropriate place in, a, in an investor's portfolio and actually can serve as complements to one another. And then I would just add briefly, and we'll talk about this as we go through the pre presentation, uh, index construction has continued to evolve and, of course, has moved beyond market cap weighting in more recent years. And the, the tremendous growth of the ETF industry has led to uh, the introduction of a number of non-market cap weighted uh, indexes that uh, provide exposure to various investment strategies, many of which have, 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 have existed for a long period of time. But uh, the ETF structure uh, uh, allowed access to these various index-based strategies in a uh, readily accessible, transparent, and rules-based format for the first time. Yeah, I expect there to be a lot of audience questions about that, the so-called smart beta. But yeah, carry on. Thanks for that answer. Sure, sure. So if we look at representativeness here as the first category within market coverage, um, it's important for all indexes, of course, to accurately represent their intended exposure. Um, but the way we think about representativeness is a little bit different depending on whether we're talking about a market benchmark or a smart beta index. So for a market benchmark such as the U.S. small cap index, for example, um, it, it's important to understand whether that index provides a fully representative uh, uh, and comprehensive coverage of uh, its targeted market segment. I indexes that don't provide that fully representative coverage can can uh, leave investors with gaps in exposure, as I mentioned, that they really might not be aware of uh, in, within their portfolios. When we look at smart beta indexes, by contrast, the, the primary consideration really isn't one of comprehensiveness of the exposure. It's, it's more of one uh, of whether or, or how well the index captures the signal to the targeted set of characteristics uh, of, of the index. Um, Examples, of course, of fundamentally weighted indexes, uh, low volatility indexes have gained increasing interest in recent years as well. But it's important for investors to understand that there are very different construction methodologies for how various low volatility indexes in the marketplace are built. So one of the key criticisms that we hear about low volatility indexes is that they can be highly concentrated in a single sector, such as utilities, for example. Um, now, there are some low volatility indexes in the market that do take a very simple approach and do tend to exhibit that high concentration in a sector such as utilities. Other low volatility indexes are built using a more nuanced um, construction approach and have historically been able to provide a more diversified sector exposure um, while still delivering that, uh, that low volatility characteristic. So it's important to understand the differences among various indexes, even that follow the same uh, stated investment strategy, of course. Now, portfolio fit, um, a, another key consideration here for all indexes. But again, it's, there's a, a bit of a distinction in how we think about market benchmarks versus smart beta indexes. So a key consideration for uh, market benchmarks is the overall modularity uh, of the index family. So how well do the individual size and style uh, segment indexes within that family fit together 
as the building blocks for asset allocation without gaps and overlap. Um, that's what we mean by modularity. Uh, for smart beta, again, it's, it's less about modularity and more, again, about how well the index captures the exposure to the um, specific focused set of characteristics that are important to uh, the investor and then how incorporating that index-based strategy into the portfolio affects the overall risk budget and, and the risk return characteristics of the portfolio. So a, a little bit more detail on, on modularity. Um, this is a, a key consideration because indexes that aren't constructed in a modular nature can, can result in gaps and overlaps in, in an investor's portfolio that represent inadvertent exposures that can really serve to undermine the intended asset allocation uh, of the investor's portfolio. So what we have here are two sets of indexes. Uh, the indexes on the right in orange are modular in nature. So you can see clearly that each of the size components uh, is fully representative of its targeted market segment. And there's a clear line of delineation or breakpoint between the small cap index and the large cap index. So investors using these indexes could construct a portfolio uh, with a very uh, precise and consistent allocation. By contrast, the indexes on the right in blue are not really modular in nature. Each of the size segments has significant gaps in exposure, first of all, and there isn't a uh, clear breakpoint between small cap and large cap. They actually have significant overlap. So investors using these indexes would have a more difficult time in, in constructing that very precise asset allocation, and they might actually end up with um, potential extra exposure, if you will, to the mid-cap uh, market segment where these indexes overlap. Now, just to further underscore that with um, a, a real-world example here, uh, what we're, we show on the left are the uh, Russell U.S. Index Series. And at Russell, we take a very objective, transparent, and modular approach to constructing our indexes, which is one of the reasons why they've been so widely adopted <clears throat> by retail investors, as well as being the institutional index uh, of choice. You can see the Russell 3000 Index, as, as Ollie mentioned at the outset, is a fully representative uh, index covering the U.S. equity market. Um, it can be broken down in a modular way uh, into its size components, the Russell 1000 index of large cap stocks and the Russell 2000 index uh, of small cap stocks, and the Russell 1 plus the Russell 2 equals the Russell 3. The Russell 1 can be further broken down into its uh, top 200 or, or mega cap component and its mid cap component. Um, but you can see that all of the indexes fit together in a very modular way and all roll up to the Russell 3000 index. Um, by contrast, the S&P indexes um, are really not modular in nature. Now, now S&P uh, may have reasons for why they conduct, construct their indexes in the way that they do, but they're really not fully modular in nature. You can see that each of the size segments has significant overlap with the other segments. Um, additionally, because uh, the indexes are not uh, uh, reconstituted on a regular annual basis, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment. The constituents of a single index, for instance, in the S&P 600 index, um, the way that, that constituents migrate from one index to another is not rules-based. Um, rather, it's, it's dependent upon the subjective decisions of an index committee. So the result of that is that a small cap company that grows out of the targeted market cap range for the small cap index may actually stay in the small cap index for an extended period of time um, until the uh, index committee decides to move it to uh, a, a, a larger uh, cap size index. Uh, Dave, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can I chime in with a quick question? Uh, Absolutely. I, I know you can't speak for S&P, but you certainly can comment on, on the following, I hope. Uh, when you talk about an investment committee that is actually making what are probably subjective calls, is that active management in any way, shape, or form in your judgment? Well, it's an index committee that uh, that, that S&P has that oversees all of its indexes and, and makes these subjective decisions about index membership. So um, it, it could be argued that there is an active decision there into which constituents will belong in which index. And in fact, the, it's, it's also important to be clear that the S&P indexes are not fully representative indexes. 
So, for instance, the S&P 500 index, contrary to uh, common understanding, doesn't represent the 500 largest companies in the U.S. equity market. It's actually a sampled selection of uh, companies from the large cap space that the index committee has decided to include in this index. So that leads to uh, the targeted uh, market cap range for the index is being different from the actual market cap ranges, and that's what's illustrated with the dark blue and light blue sections for the indexes here. Because uh, the, in the indexes are not reconstituted and brought back into alignment with the targeted market cap ranges on an annual basis, the actual market cap ranges can differ widely, as you see here, leading to significant overlap in terms of market cap coverage for the indexes. So uh, we just believe that a rules-based uh, transparent modular approach gives investors uh, more precise tools to construct their asset allocation. Now, moving on and, and just looking a little bit more in, about this idea of objectivity and transparency, this comes into consideration in, in the construction approach section. And again, as I mentioned, it's, it's important for investors to understand uh, whether their indexes are constructed using a, a rules-based process where the rules are clear and unbiased and readily available, published in an index methodology document on the provider's website. Because indexes that are, are more objective and transparent in nature provide greater certainty to investors about their exposures, and they're more predictable, easier to track. By contrast, indexes that are constructed using a more subjective approach are less predictable, they're harder to track, and um, they lead to greater uncertainty for investors. And with the already elevated levels of uncertainty in the marketplace, the last thing that investors need, need is additional uncertainty. So by using indexes that are constructed using a more objective and transparent approach, it just helps to eliminate this potential additional uncertainty. Now, weighting, of course, is another key consideration in terms of, of construction approach, and uh, we'll look at market cap uh, indexes first. Uh, market cap, of course, being uh, determined by the, the price times the number of shares outstanding. Um, <clears throat> a key feature of market cap weighted indexes is that they really don't need regular rebalancing because uh, market cap adjusts along with price. As price is in the market for an for a security rise or fall, the market cap uh, falls or rises along with that, of course. So the indexes are really constantly rebalancing. Rebalance, regular rebalancing isn't uh, really necessary. That leads to uh, very low turnover for market cap weighted indexes. Now, I would uh, underscore, though, the distinction between rebalancing and reconstitution, however, because reconstitution is still a very important uh, uh, process that needs to be incorporated on a regular basis to bring the index back into um, its targeted uh, uh, market cap ranges, for instance, and make sure that those remain accurate over time. So reconstitution is actually stepping back and completely rebuilding the indexes, um, starting from the broad global, uh, global investment universe, to make sure that individual constitu constituents are assigned to the correct size, style, country indexes, for example, and making sure that those remain uh, consistent and representative over time. Now, another key uh, consideration here in terms of weighting is float adjustment. And what this refers, refers to is that, uh, in many cases, the number of shares that are actually available for sale and purchase uh, by investors is, is different from the total number of shares that the firm has issued. Uh, in many cases, shares uh, might be locked up uh, in, in IPO lockups and can't, aren't available uh, to be traded. Uh, they could be uh, held in, in large uh, private uh, uh, holdings, for instance, and not really be publicly available. Um, so Russell uh, innovated uh, this idea of float adjustment when we introduced our U.S. index series. and um, this eliminates the shares that really aren't available for sale and purchase to only reflect the shares that are available in the marketplace because this represents the true opportunity set for investors. Um, and that's illustrated here on this slide where we have a, a handful of large cap companies 
and we have on the left the total market capitalization of those companies and their ranking based on that total market capitalization as of the most recent uh, uh, Russell Index reconstitution in June of this year. And then next to that on the right we have the float adjusted market capitalization where those unavailable shares have been removed and the actual ranking in the Russell 1000 index uh, based on that float adjustment. Now for Apple, you see that its ranking is uh, at the top of the index, or was at the time of the reconstitution, regardless of whether we look at total market cap or float adjusted market cap, all of its shares are actually available on the market. However, when we look at uh, a company like Walmart, its uh, actual ranking in the Russell 1000 is significantly smaller than its ranking based on total market cap because a little less than half of its uh, total market capitalization is actually available for purchase and sale on, on uh, the exchanges. Um, so to assign a weighting based on total market cap would not be truly reflective of the opportunity set for investors. Likewise, for a company like Facebook, uh, we see a significant difference between its ranking based on total market cap versus float adjusted market cap. In this case, of course, um, uh, Facebook had a, held an IPO not so long ago, and in an IPO, frequently there are lockups around the shares held by uh, employees and other company insiders. They can't be sold for a, a set period of time. Now, if we had looked at this uh, a year ago, we'd see an even greater difference between uh, the, the total market cap and float-adjusted market cap for Facebook because over time, as those IPO lockups have expired, uh, more of those shares have become available for sale and purchase, and so the float-adjusted market cap has moved uh, closer to the total market cap, but you can see that there's still a significant difference here. Now, if we continue with weighting and, and look at a number of uh, uh, non-market cap weighted uh, strategies, such as equal weighting, fundamental weighting, uh, factor weighting, such as, as low volatility, um, here, it's very important for investors to understand the specific methodology for how the index is weighted. It's not enough just to understand that it's even equal weighted, for instance, because there can be very different methodologies. Um, so equal weighting on the face of it, of course, sounds like about the simplest strategy that could be implemented. Simply take all of the constituents from a parent index and assign them all the same weighting. Um, but we know that that can actually lead to inadvertent uh, sector biases in an index that really are not an intended uh, objective of uh, an investor seeking to simply diversify their exposures equally across all of the uh, constituents of an index. So we illustrate that here with um, uh, these, these uh, sector weighting charts for uh, the Russell 1000 index on the far left. And clearly, financial services, technology are the largest uh, uh, sector weightings in, in the index. This is well known. These uh, uh, sectors have significant influence on the index. If we move to the far right of the chart and we look at a uh, version of the Russell 1000 index that would be weighted uh, in this simple equal weighted strategy where every constituent has the same weighting, you, you see these inadvertent sector biases. Uh, financial services actually becomes nearly a quarter of the portfolio. This is clearly not uh, an intended objective of an investor uh, using an equal weighted strategy. So we use a more nuanced approach in constructing the Russell equal weighted indexes, and that's what's shown in the middle chart, where we actually equal weight the sectors first, and then equal weight constituents within the sectors, which we think provides a more representative, diversified, equal weighted type of exposure. So this is just a, one example, but clearly even something as simple as equal weighting, there can be very different methodologies that various index providers take in constructing the indexes. So it's very important for investors to uh, look a little bit further below the surface to, to understand clearly how uh, the underlying index is built. Uh, quick question about equal weighting. Uh, it, it's, it's generally uh, – I don't want to get all, all pointy-headed with my terminology. It's higher beta. It's, uh, it, it, it tends to be uh, faster on the way up and faster on the way down as, as a general proposition relative to cap weight. Is that fair? 
I, I think that is fair. An equal weighted strategy just by its nature will have any any strategy that moves away from cap weighting is going to have some um, uh, small cap, uh, greater small cap, smaller cap exposure, if you will. So it, it's going to have uh, a, a size uh, movement away from uh, the largest cap. Uh, names that are uh, that make up a, a larger portion of the market cap weighted index. So that does lead to uh, some difference in, in characteristics in, in terms of volatility. Now, the uh, more nuanced approach that I described that we take with the, the uh, Russell equal weighted indexes um, is going to have a little bit less of that uh, that size bias than a simple equal weighted strategy. But but you're absolutely right there. Thanks. Um, now with rebalancing. Um, this is, of course, another uh, very key consideration when we think about ongoing maintenance with an index. And as, as I described, market uh, cap-weighted uh, indexes really don't need regular rebalancing. They do need uh, a regular reconstitution, and annual is the, the period that's generally used there. Um, by contrast, those smart beta indexes are regularly, regularly rebalanced, um, semi-annual, quarterly, and, and even monthly in many cases. And this regular rebalancing process is very important for these strategies because the objective of, of these indexes is to provide a more focused exposure to a uh, specific set of characteristics. And this more frequent rebalancing is necessary to maintain that exposure consistently over time. Now, it, it, it's important to understand for investors what that rebalancing frequency is because there are implications associated with that, one of them being potentially uh, higher turnover. I would emphasize, however, that this, this higher turnover in, in, isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as it is within reasonable bounds because, again, the objective of these indexes is, is to maintain that exposure to this more focused set of characteristics consistently and a more frequent uh, rebalance and some turnover is necessary to consistently maintain that exposure. But again, regardless, it, it's, it's important for investors to understand what that rebalancing frequency is and what the potential implications of that are. Now, in terms of, of corporate actions, again, as I stated at the outset, it's important for investors to understand whether uh, the index uses an objective, transparent, uh, process for regularly incorporating these actions, such as mergers and acquisitions and IPOs, into the index, or whether a more subjective process is used that can lead to uh, more uncertainty as to what the exposures of the index uh, will be and how they, they may change over time. Um, the next slide here, we just we illustrate that with a few well-known companies. And we show here uh, for Starbucks, Google, and Microsoft uh, the date on the left when they entered the Russell indexes. Uh, at Russell, we use, a, again, a very transparent and objective and uh, rules-based approach where we incorporate IPOs on a quarterly basis. So investors will know that uh, these companies will be included in the index shortly after they hold their, their uh, initial public offering. By contrast, uh, on the right, we have the date when each of these companies actually entered the S&P indexes uh, because they, again, use a more subjective process based on the decisions uh, of the index committee as to when to include these specific companies in the index. And you can see that, that uh, in, in uh, many cases here, there was an extended period of time between the dates when they entered one index versus the other. So it's important for investors to understand this process, whether it is objective and rules-based in nature or whether it is more subjective in nature, because uh, investors using indexes that do take a more subjective approach to including IPOs need to understand that they might not uh, have exposure to these companies that they thought they did over uh, quite a number of years and, and uh, could potentially miss out on the early stages of growth for these companies and uh, significant market appreciation, as you see in this case. So just to, to um, wrap it up here uh, with a few additional pieces of important criteria, uh, I talked quite a bit about representativeness, which is, is very important. Uh, as we think about representativeness, however, it's also, of course, 
uh, very important that the index at the end of the day is investable. So you need to understand clearly uh, how uh, readily available the constituents are, of the index are in the, uh, on the exchange. Are they very liquid? Can they be easily bought and sold um, in order to implement the, uh, the strategy in a very efficient way? Uh, the operational capabilities of the index provider uh, itself are also a key consideration. Uh, is the index provider established and, and are, are its indexes widely used? Uh, have its operational capabilities been proven over time, particularly through Hello? Ollie, are you still there? I am, yes. Hello, Ollie? Yes, I am here. Uh, sorry, I, I had a little telecom uh, difficulty there. Uh, you can hear okay. me now, okay? Yes, uh, I, uh, I can, yes. Okay, apologies Carry on. for that, everybody. So, uh, and then finally, data availability. Uh, very important to understand uh, whether uh, an index provider's data is published and widely, widely accessible on major platforms. So all of these pieces of index criteria are very important for uh, investors to understand to make sure that they're gaining the exposures that they had intended, avoiding potentially unintended exposures and unintended outcomes as a result. Now, just in the, in the final few slides here quickly, just wanted to highlight Russell's leadership in, in many of the areas that we've just talked through. Um, over our 30-year heritage of insight and innovation, we are happy to have consistently been recognized for the perspective, precision, and predictability uh, that Russell indexes have delivered to investors uh, over that time. And again, as I mentioned, many of our innovations have been widely adopted by other index providers over time, such as uh, size and style segmentation, uh, float adjustment, which we introduced in the early 1980s as well, uh, has been widely adopted over time. And then we've continued to innovate over uh, the years as well. And the precise and transparent approach, very modular and objective approach that we take in constructing the Russell indexes is something that we're well known for and has led to them, again, being widely adopted by both retail and institutional investors alike. Uh, as you mentioned at the outset, Ali, uh, $4.1 trillion in assets benchmarked globally to Russell indexes, and uh, about 72% of institutional U.S. equity products are benchmarked to a Russell index uh, with clear leadership among uh, the various areas mentioned here. So just to conclude, um, very simply, just, just uh, would, would say that at Russell, we understand very clearly that methodology matters for investors. So just as an investor would spend time trying to understand the philosophy and process for an actively managed strategy, it's very important for investors to clearly understand the characteristics of their investment product, but also very clearly how the underlying index is constructed. because. Uh, indexes that do follow uh, the same basic stated strategy can take very different approaches uh, in how they're built and lead to very different uh, exposures. And then finally, I, I'd just like to mention that we launched a new website recently specifically for financial advisors at www.methodologymatters.com. And on this uh, website, we have a number of uh, white papers, videos, and other materials that can offer investors uh, insight into index construction and more information about Russell indexes. And we're adding new content to this website all the time. So t please take a moment uh, to visit that website. Methodologymatters.com, is that what you said, Dave? That's correct, methodologymatters.com. Okay, yeah. Thanks. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, encourage everybody at, at, at their leisure to uh, read through the disclosure page here and just thank everybody again for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and your interest. And Ollie, I, I think we have plenty of time for questions here, so I'm happy to uh, take as many questions as, as we can fit in. Great, Dave. Yeah, we, we, indeed, we indeed have time for some questions, and, and we, we have some from the audience, uh, quite, quite a few of them, which is great. Uh, and, and again, let me remind uh, audience members, if you do have a question, uh, please enter it at the lower right 
of your screens. Um, so just to get right off, I, I can hear John Bogle ra railing. I have the privilege of speaking with him from time to time in my role as, a, as managing editor here at Index Universe. And, and he's always railing about, you know, uh, smartphone indexes and uh, this kind of stuff. And I'm wondering if you might um, share your opinion about, you know, at what point does uh, a kind of a cool intellectual concept become just a terribly bad investment idea? Is there a line in your in the sand that you draw in your own mind? How how, how would you attack that 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 issue? Because it, it does seem real on some level. You know, it gets away from the precepts of index investing. Sure. Well, there there certainly is a, a great deal of discussion and and debate about uh, indexes that are extremely narrowly defined, um, right? And and at some point, I think that's a valid criticism that the index has become so narrow that. It's it's really not providing what uh, uh, the the broad exposure that an index is intended to provide, uh, whether that be a global index or uh, a, a U.S. index or even a segment of or style of, of a U.S. index. Um, there is there is a point where it, the narrowness can become so great that it it really fails to hold up to uh, what an index is intended to provide. Um, now I, I would. I would say that there has been significant innovation, of course, in recent years uh, that has moved beyond market cap weighted indexes, and there's considerable debate about that as well. Um, but I, I would say that many of these non-market uh, cap, non cap weighted indexes represent strategies that have existed for quite some time, and um, there is a sound economic uh, rationale underlying them. Um, and certainly at, at Russell, we don't just jump on the bandwagon to introduce uh, new indexes just for the sake of, of, of new indexes. Um, everything that we do is designed to provide investors uh, better tools for making better investment decisions. And um, we, of, of course, uh, were instrumental in uh, creating uh, size and style segment in, segmented indexes with the creation of the Russell 1000, Russell 2000 indexes uh, in uh, 1984 and following that up with the development of the first growth and value style indexes in 1987. And then in recent years, we have uh, continued our innovation with non-cap weighted indexes such as fundamentally weighted indexes, uh, various factor indexes uh, such as low volatility indexes, equal weighted indexes, and others. And, and we think that there is uh, validity in these non-market cap weighted indexes as complements to the uh, traditional market cap weighted indexes. Can, can you can you step in there? there? There are some audience questions on that very subject. You know, I, I, actually, the word validity appears uh, uh, in, in these questions. You know, how do you feel about the validity of, of smart beta strategies? You say it's a complement. Um, can you shed some more light on, on how to sort of view uh, the cap-weighted indexes uh, and, and how they might be combined in exposure schemes with these smart beta strategies, please? Absolutely, absolutely. So market cap-weighted indexes are a very efficient way to gain uh, – well, first of all, they're, they're the true representation of, of the market is, is how we would view them. And so they represent the most accurate way to measure the market segment. Um, now, in terms of, of actually gaining a, an exposure through an investment strategy, they do represent a very efficient, uh, potentially low-cost way to implement um, a pure market beta exposure. Um, market cap weighted indexes do have some biases in them, though, right? They're, the, the market cap weighting is tied to price, and so uh, the, the companies with the largest market cap uh, will tend to have the uh, or, or do have the greatest weight in the index. So they tend to have a growth bias to them and somewhat of a momentum bias. As prices move up, uh, the, the market cap weighted index will reflect that. Some of the non-market cap weighted indexes have uh, different emphases. So uh, a fundamentally weighted index, for example, will tend to have a, a, a bit of a value bias. Now that value exposure is dynamic in nature. It's a little bit different than just a, a, a simple value index, uh, but it does tend to have a, a value bias. And additionally, it breaks the link with uh, price that's inherent in a market cap weighted index. So uh, it, it, it has different characteristics from the market cap weighted index, which makes it a very nice complement 
uh, to the, the cap-weighted uh, index. Additionally, other non-market cap-weighted indexes, such as low volatility indexes, for example, um, really focus on the risk side of, uh, of the consideration, and uh, the primary objective there being to deliver a lower standard deviation of returns. Now, as I mentioned, these various strategies uh, have, have a, a sound uh, economic rationale behind them, and they also are supported by a wide body of academic research as well. And the historical context uh, for what this, this research has found in many cases is that non-cap weighted indexes have been able to uh, historically improve on the risk adjusted returns relative to the cap weighted index, either through enhanced returns, such as the fundamentally weighted index, which has been shown to historically be able to provide uh, excess return relative to the cap weighted index with relatively comparable level of volatility, or on the other side, uh, a defensive or low volatility index um, that historically has been, they've been shown to be able to provide a lower standard deviation of returns with a relatively comparable or even slightly better uh, return than the cap weighted index. So getting to, to improved risk adjusted returns. Now, the implementation, of course, of that. So, needs so to are you saying about those, I'm, I'm sorry, Dave, are you saying about those inc instances essentially that there's an outperformance? Uh, for, for these smart beta funds, is, is that what you just said, essentially, uh, both on the upside and, and at least protecting off the, on the downside, if you will? Uh, what I said is, is there is a, they've historically been shown to be able to provide a, an improved risk-adjusted return. So it okay. depends on what you mean by outperformance. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the fundamentally weighted indexes, they have been able to provide excess returns of about 2 to 4% um, in developed markets and a little bit more than that in less efficient markets again, with a comparable level of volatility to the cap-weighted counterpart, leading to a, a, an improved risk-adjusted return. Um, on the low volatility side, um, it, it's more about the lower standard deviation, uh, the lower volatility, which is, is primarily leading to the improved risk-adjusted return. Now, over long periods of time, low volatility strategies have been able to, um, have been shown to provide comparable or even slightly better returns in the cap-weighted index, but the improved risk-adjusted return in this case is primarily from the lower uh, volatility. Okay, perfect. There's an interesting question here. Are there derivatives, uh, futures and options available on, on any of the broad, uh, uh, broadly used uh, Russell indexes? Oh, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Can you speak to a couple there, of them? Uh, um, I know there are probably quite a lot, but uh, this is one, you know, right. 3,000 to 2,000 to 1,000, whatever, you know, uh, Right. All of the major indexes have, have um, uh, those derivatives uh, are, are available. So I, I wouldn't speak specifically, but uh, broadly um, the answer to the question is yes. Can you offer any uh, observations or, or, or uh, any comments on fixed income indexes? We've been very equity-centric here. Uh, that's clearly an area of the indexing world that is uh, – uh, it's ripe for uh, for innovation. Uh, can you speak to where Russell sits in, in, in that traffic? Sure. Well, we, we do have uh, LDI indexes. We also have, uh, we, we uh, fairly recently launched a, a series of currency indexes, what we call conscious currency uh, indexes. Um, we, we don't have a broad series of uh, fixed income benchmarks, so I, I wouldn't have uh, any, any uh, informed comments or, or specific uh, details that I could speak to there. Now, one of the things that you hear about fundamental indexing, you, you, you mentioned, for example, that, that market cap uh, indexes don't need uh, rebalancing so much as some of these other smart beta strategies do. And as far as that goes, that means transactions, that means trading friction. Um, to what extent is that a factor in, 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 in taking away from returns? And, and perhaps this question is most appropriate for far-flung uh, markets, you know, emerging markets where you have a less liquid uh, underlying securities of, of, uh, of a particular uh, fund or index, as it were. Sure. Well, sure. well that's, that's uh, definitely true and a, a valid uh, uh, piece of uh, – a, a valid consideration. Um, I, I don't know that it uh, is an argument for um, – the inefficacy of these strategies by any means. Um, the 
non-cap weighted strategies just by their nature do require some rebalancing. That's what leads to um, uh, the consistency of the exposure. And in the case of fundamentally weighted indexes, um, the, the contra trading that occurs uh, through the rebalancing process um, is, is something that actually uh, leads to the, the uh, excess returns over time uh, that those strategies have been able to provide. Uh, so some turnover is, is actually, and some trading is, is actually uh, beneficial there. Now, it, it does lead to potential uh, frictions in terms of trading costs that need to be taken into account by all means. Um, but if we stick with fundamentally weighted indexes, for example, uh, the turnover is, does not rise to uh, extreme levels uh, by any means. So the Russell uh, 1000 index, for example, has extremely low turnover um, because of what I described, maybe 3% a year or so. Um, if we look at uh, a broad fundamentally weighted index, um, that, that turnover will be a little higher perhaps, but we're only talking about 10, 12, maybe 15% um, annually. So the, the turnover is within uh, very reasonable bounds and certainly much, much lower than the turnover for the average uh, actively managed strategy. Right. Now, uh, there's some questions coming in here about exposure gaps uh, with fundamental indexes. Uh, are you going to have uh, significant gaps there when you compare uh, your own uh, indexes, a cap weight version versus, a, 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 say, a, a you know low ball or whatever it happens to be? Uh, how does the how does the exposure gap issue shake out in the fundamental uh, universe? Right. Well, fundamental uh, fundamental indexes are um, well. First of all, we're we're not talking about broad market benchmarks. We're talking about an index that fits more into this this smart beta strategy. So, um, by by its nature, smart beta indexes are generally more focused in nature. Um, that said, the fun, fundamental weighting um, is really looking at the broad uh, investment universe and constructing the various size indexes based on their fundamental weights. So it will have a broad representative exposure um, to the size segment that is targeted, whether that be large cap or small cap, um, based on the fundamental weightings of the uh, constituents of, of each of those indexes. So we're, we're not really talking about uh, sampling in this case or significant gaps in exposure. We're talking about a different uh, weighting methodology uh, with fundamental in particular, uh, breaking the linkage with price and weighting the, the individual constituents by these various fundamental measures as opposed to a price oriented measure. Okay. Now, you had said at the beginning kind of reframing the active versus passive uh, debate, if you will, as an active and passive uh, stance. That seems to be that's Russell's uh, official line, he said, I think. And I'm wondering, to the extent that active is part of the mix, do you consider, as let's say the Vanguard group would, that uh, anything that's not cap-weighted is by its nature active, and therefore you can actually act on you know the, the Russell acceptance of both active and passive using rules-based strategies in both cases, but one being market cap and, say, one being you know volatility or momentum or something? Sure. Well, it, it's an interesting question, and it, it's semantics on, on, on some level, but there are also, also some key distinctions here because um, there's sort of a spectrum, if you will. A, 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 tr a traditional market cap weighted index is, is pure beta exposure. Um, an actively managed strategy um, is, has historically been sort of the, the realm of alpha, and that's been the key distinction. Um, but when we think about smart beta indexes, it's sort of in this, Middle, middle space you might think of as the intersection of active and passive. So it's, it's different from uh, pure market cap weighted, pure beta exposure in that it's moving away from market cap. Um, so we're, we're running out of time, Dave, so um, move, move, move in for the kill here. Yeah, you, you could say that there are active decisions in the index construction process, but it's still very it's transparent, it's rules-based in nature, so it's not actively managed on an ongoing basis. Once the index is constructed and rules are set, those are maintained. Um, the difference with actively managed strategies is that the, the active manager will be making forecasts and judgments 
and so on. That's not part of the rules-based index strategy uh, that, that we're talking about in terms of smart beta indexes. Got it. Okay, well, that, uh, that uh, wraps it up in terms of the time we have. Uh, thanks for joining this expert series webinar on index methodology, what you don't know but should. Dave, thanks for being my guest. And I also want to thank the audience for attending and for submitting some uh, really good questions. Uh, remember, uh, a few of you have asked along the way that the, this presentation will be available within 24 to 40 hours, and uh, all, all of you who attended will receive an email informing you that it